I am Song, your conferences and engagement manager, and I'm the S of S&P, and as always with me is my bestie. I'm Paul, I'm the P of S&P. Song, our conference is almost here. I know, I our know. Our first I... in-person conference, your first ever in-person NAI conference. I, I can't believe it's been, you know, almost two years since our last in-person conference for NAI overall. I'm so excited to get to Palm Springs and and to see everybody. And I, you know, I'm I'm disappointed that not everyone can make it in person. But our our virtual conference, our online conference, is also going to be great, which we proved yes. last year with the great online conference that you put together. So group effort. It was definitely a group effort, and this is definitely a group effort as well. Uh, but yes, the we are live streaming some really awesome parts of the in person to anybody who is at their office or home office or in their car listening. Um, be careful, don't, don't drive distracted. Well, do right. not drive distracted. Right, right, right. And you know, these things will be recorded and available after the fact. So if you're you know, in traffic, maybe don't listen to the <laughs> online conference, maybe hold that one. Right, but for sure, our uh, opening keynote is going to be live streamed. So, uh, we just met one of our keynotes, Mr. Greg Shields, um, fabulous guy. And today, Paul, do you know who's with us today? I do know who's with us today because we planned this podcast together, Song. So, uh, but I appreciate the question. Charles Thomas of Outward Bound Adventure uh, is going to talk to us about the amazing work that that they are doing. His organization has been doing such incredible work, getting people in underserved communities and urban communities outdoors to experience the very important benefits of being outdoors. And so we're going to talk to him, I believe, right now. Well, Charles Thomas, thank you so much for joining us here on the S&P. Uh, we are thrilled to have you be one of our keynote uh, speakers at our national conference coming up soon. Thank you for having me. I always appreciate an opportunity to put the word out to a broader audience and NAI is that broad audience that we want to get it out to. Thank you. So give us a little brief history about um, OBA and, and how long have you been involved with the organization? I think I got involved with OBA when dinosaurs roamed the earth. I have been involved uh, since 1969 with this organization. OBA is the oldest organization in the United States that's dedicated exclusively to serving underserved, overlooked, and avoided populations and getting them connected to nature. And in 1969, the founder of OBA uh, was my science teacher, and she recognized that I could really uh, benefit from time spent outdoors because I was just an actual uh, tightly wound spring bouncing off the walls in the eighth grade classroom. And so um, she took me on a 14 day wilderness backpacking trip. And it, you know, I didn't have an epiphany about the wilderness or being outdoors, but what it did was actually open up a portal that later on came to play a pivotal role in my life, everything that I did thereafter. So, so thank you, Charles. And it's, uh, obviously it's such important work that you're doing. Um, and I think there's sort of there's sort of two sides to this conversation. And I'll, I'll ask about uh, one of them first, um, bringing underserved populations into wild spaces, into nature. What are, what are the barriers and, and why is it important that we do that? Well, well, well first, let me start with, uh, um, I'll answer both those questions, but I, I want to start with the second question, why is it important that we do that? And I'll answer that with a, another question, which is, is there a noticeable lack or dearth of urban people of color in the outdoors? And if so, why is that? And when we start to sort of dismantle that question or start adding uh, answers to that question, you'll you'll have the answer to the two questions that you just asked me. Uh, the first thing is why should we be bringing uh, people of color into the outdoors is because the environmental and conservation movement are two absolutely essential movements as you can tell right now where we are. I mean, it, it's not just the fact that we're getting people connected to nature, but we're getting people connected to understanding 
that we live on a planet that has finite resources. And in order to manage and control ourselves from depleting our own resources, we have to have a, a foundational understanding of where those resources come from and what uh, it's like to extract from the planet. So a lot of that comes from the environmental movement and the conservation movement, um, understanding that and really pushing you know, us towards becoming a, a kinder and gentler race of people uh, that are living on the planet. And there's been a huge segment of the American population that's been left out of that for multiple reasons. But if we're going to be effective as environmentalists or if we're going to be effective as conservationists, we've got to broaden the base of this movement. And that segment of the population that's been left out uh, needs to be part of that so that everybody that reaps the therapeutic benefits of spending time outdoors and are get, extracting resources understands the role that they play in um, living on planet Earth. The, the flip side of, of the equation for, uh, you know, open spaces, uh, you know, being involved in nature is the profession of interpretation uh, and environmental education and, and, you know, our parks and our, our, our spaces. What are the barriers to entry for underserved urban populations in the professions of interpretation or environment, environmental education? So, so I don't think that there are nearly as many barriers in the profession now as there are in the structure of making people adequately prepared to enter into the profession. Uh, so, you know, if you ask your, your uh, normal or your typical interpreter or the person that goes into interpretation, um, they tend to be middle-class whites. Uh, they tend to have had some sort of background or contact with being outdoors. They tend to have had a broader uh, scope of education and experience in, um, in, in the outdoors. And so if you look at urban communities of color and low-income populations of color, especially the BIPOC community, the Black Indigenous people of color, they don't have that same type of pedigree. And they don't have that because they have been, uh, as you know, the term goes, they've been marginalized. Uh, they don't have the uh, income that it takes sometimes to get out and do those kinds of things. They tend to be concentrated in larger urban areas and a lot of the trailheads and a lot of the access to the wilderness. Uh, I'm speaking specifically of what I know of when I talk about interpretation of the outdoors, obviously. And then, of course, they uh, oftentimes, as we've been uh, criticized for, and I say we, those of us in interpretation have been criticized for, the stories have not been well told of the contributions of uh, people of color in the outdoors. And so when you don't see yourself, it's very easy not to see yourself in that arena. And um, I think that's been some of the barriers, some of the big barriers outside of just some of the systemic barriers that come in from uh, the marginalization of people of color that uh, are typically access points into the fields of interpretation. Thanks, Charles. That kind of brings me to another question. Um, not only do you have your, your mission um, at Outward Bound Adventures, of bringing um, people and children, kids, uh, you know, from urban settings into the outdoors. But you also do a lot of uh, Jedi type workshopping. Uh, so can you explain to us a little bit about uh, like what, what types of workshops do you do and who do you go present those to and work with? Absolutely. So a Jedi, for those folks that aren't familiar with the term, is justice, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion. And uh, the types of folks that we typically present to are usually people in the conservation and environmental field. Uh, we just did a Jedi workshop, a three-day Jedi workshop to uh, the Outdoor uh, Wilderness Symposium, which is the outdoor behavior healthcare industry that takes young kids out into the outdoors and upgrades their uh, social skills through these wilderness trips. And our Jedi workshops are uh, very fundamental 
we help folks understand that there is inherent bias in the way they see the world, uh, perceive and receive the world. We help them understand that diversity is a very measurable thing. And that uh, here's how you go. We give them tools about going about achieving diversity. And we help them understand that equity doesn't necessarily mean treating everybody the same. You know, it means gi giving people equal opportunity. And it doesn't necessarily mean, okay, everyone has across the board has to be treated the same. And that inclusion is very, uh, a very, very um, necessary thing to achieve all of the other things. You must be included. And sometimes, you know, we say, oh, we opened the door. We made a seat at the table for folks. Well, you know, we believe that under OVA, our bond adventures is that um, now we're at a point where, the, you know, the door isn't, it, inclusion isn't just opening the door and offering somebody a seat at the table, but it's really about dismantling the table, bringing people in and rebuilding that table so everybody sits equally around the table and as opposed to joining a conversation. Uh, an aftermarket bolt-on doesn't work very well uh, with uh, Jedi work. So this is obviously, I mean, it's almost sort of an obligatory question these days, but you know, the world's a different place now than it was 18 months ago. Uh, how, has, yeah. how has Outward Bound Adventures and, and how has your program specifically changed because of the pandemic? That's a great question because a lot of people don't understand the, 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 the nature of the work that we do, how the pandemic has affected those of us that are moving uh, young folks and people in general, because we work with adults as well, moving them away from the city and doing work in the outdoors where everyone thinks it's safe. But, you know, you got to you got to transport people and you got to meet with people and you got to train people. And so it has had a profound impact in terms of the numbers that we typically serve. So whereas we would have served 1,500 to 1,500 kids uh, last year, if we ran a full program, we only served 300 kids. And what we did was we were very particular about uh, who we serve because so many of our uh, people in our population are uh, housebound and they tend to be housebound in a way that a lot of us are not. And meaning that there's seven people in a one bedroom apartment. And so we look at, you know, uh, alleviating alleviating the pressure on that family most as opposed to someone that has a two or three bedroom house so the other way that it's affected us is that so we we travel in 15 passenger vans but you can't put 15 people in a 15 passenger van and if you don't know if they're um, all been vaccinated or you know if they're asymptomatic so we've spread that out we made sure that all of our staff were vaccinated as soon as possible uh, we're also training 30 brand new staff right now. We had to change all of our training regimes to accommodate that. So we spend a lot more time outdoors. But just taking the kids out into nature is, uh, I think the biggest thing, Paul, to answer your question is that we've had to, instead of put 15 people in a van, we've had to put four people in a van mm -hmm. and been very careful about our vaccinations. Wow. Well, well, you've mentioned, um, you know, I, I, the benefit of, uh, literally just being outside and going to the outdoors. Um, uh, you've mentioned like the therapeutic benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I know you just spoke at another conference uh, here in Utah uh, recently about those types of, of wellness benefits. And I think uh, dur certainly during the pandemic, there was a lot and still is quite an emphasis on mental well-being and emotional well-being from being um, you know, uh, stuck in your house, uh, maybe not being able to see family and friends, uh, not being able to go out and socialize. So how have you seen, uh, you know, maybe behaviors change or what is your, what is your take on the, the relationship between overall well-being and being able to go outside? The most important thing about wellness being related to the outside is the fact that uh, numerous studies, uh, multiple studies have determined that having a connection to nature uh, actually is in our genetic material. And if you read Biophilia by E.O. Wilson and any other of the famous folks, uh, you'll know that uh, any sort of nature uh, connection is absolutely crucial. In fact, I just read a study recently where they are taking 
uh, guys on death row, and it's mostly men, on death row, and they're putting them into cells, and they're uh, immersing the cell in scenes of nature, and they're doing that to calm uh, the death row inmates, and so they do that, you know, on a daily basis, because these guys know that they're about to die, and so they, they determine by connecting them up to all kinds of monitors that just seeing a scene of nature uh, tends to uh, drop your heartbeat and lower your blood pressure. And so uh, when you are denied access to nature, when you don't have uh, adequate um, uh, transportation or any way to get connected to nature, then uh, you know, you're, it's almost like being denied a civil right. However, when you have something like COVID come in and the folks that were getting out to nature can no longer get to nature, um, it has been, it has a profound impact on folks who've had like one or two uh, experiences in nature that want to get out and organizations like ours can't serve as many people as we uh, had been able to. But yeah, uh, there is no uh, mistake that having a connection to nature has a profound therapeutic value on humans and everybody uh, should be getting out and connected to nature. And when you can't, you know, that, you know, of course makes, puts us in a much different position that's typically not good for us. I mean, right. I, I think that one of the very basic, uh, easy answers is just look at your screensaver options. Yeah, there you go. And really, there's so many yeah. and they're all these beautiful nature scenes. And I think there's, a very specific reason for that because right. it gives you a break. It kind of, it does, it calms you down. It gives you this feeling of Zen. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, yeah, just from a screensaver to actually going outside and being able to participate is incredible. Right. So right. we just love the work that you're doing, Charles. Thank you. I did a survey in a school in South Central years ago and I told everybody to put their heads down on the desk and, uh, create in their mind a very calming scene uh, and something that makes you feel at peace. And then afterwards, they pulled their heads up from the desk and I asked each of them, there were about 35 students in the room, I asked each of them to describe the scene. Inevitably, everybody described a scene outdoors that was not in the city. So, and this was, this, these were middle school kids in South Central LA who hadn't gone out. So, you know, it, it's, it's in our genetics. Uh, so Charles, uh, can you just tell us, because I think people are familiar with, with Outward Bound, what's the difference between Outward Bound Adventures and Outward Bound? I'm glad you asked that, Paul. Uh, so Outward Bound Adventures is obviously a smaller organization because we chose not to go national. Our focus is in underserved communities of color uh, that typically are low income, and we are not so much focused on leadership as we are focused on engaging an audience that historically has been absent from conservation in the environmental field, as well as leadership, because we think that's super critical. But our ultimate objective, our goal, is to make sure that um, urban people of color have access to the environmental arena and careers in conservation. Outward Bound is really uh, focusing on developing leadership skills in an outdoor venue. While some of our pedagogy is somewhat the same, uh, our populations and our end uh, product is very different. Well, Charles, we are so thrilled that, again, that you're going to be joining us in Palm Springs, and uh, we can't wait for, oh, right. Palm Springs, I'm just, AKA, I'm gesturing to Palm Springs. <laughs> AKA Paul's office obviously yes. is in Palm yeah, Springs yeah. since May. I, I'm in a helicopter over Palm Springs right now, so. All right. <laughs> uh, and we're very much looking forward to, uh, you know, diving a little deeper and uh, being able to, you know, get some takeaways for how, you know, we as individuals or we as our, in our organization, either um, as an association or uh, just wherever people might be employed, um, you know, to become a little more inclusive and to really take home some of these best practices. So I can't wait. Such an important conversation and all of our in-person participants will be uh, there to enjoy it. And then obviously we'll be streaming the keynote live to our virtual participants as well. So 
Uh, every participant gets to to come hear this this really important uh, topic of conversation. So Charles, thank you so much for your time right now and for joining us in Palm Springs live and in person. All right, I look forward to working with you folks and really am excited about being able to give some folks some takeaway tools to work on their organizations in themselves. Thank you so much for your time. All right, well, Paul, we've got work to do. We've got, we've got you know, conference to plan. So, uh, I mean, I'm just gonna play the Europe song from now until we see each other at conference. Final countdown? Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. All I can think of when I hear that song anymore is Joe Bluth doing a magic show in Arrested Development. So, I know, this is why you and I actually are friends. One of the many. That's true. <laughs> so we've got work to do, Paul. So we're gonna uh, say goodbye for this episode, but uh, super excited. Keynotes are gonna be great. Concurrent sessions are gonna be amazing. The online concurrent sessions, equally amazing. So no matter where you are, come join us in Palm Springs or join us online for the national conference. You can still register. We've got plenty of time for the online oh, conference. Can I say something important about the, the online sessions? Okay. With the exceptions of the keynotes, the online conference is online only conference and it is for our online participants. It's not just a you know, second rate version of the live conference. It is actual explicitly for our online participants. Yes, and all of these sessions online uh, will live there on demand for three months after the conference. So you can watch them in between your holiday binge watching. And not while you're driving. Not while you're driving. All right, we got to go, Paul. Okay, we got work to do. See everybody.